Welcome now to Champions YouTube friends, dropping your comments and questions in that chat and make sure you smash the like and subscribe buttons as we talk with the man, Fabrizio Romano. Here we go. I'm Enjoy and I'm joined by the House of Champion. Yes, that's right. There's James Benz right there. How are you doing, James Benz? Good to see you. I'm good, thanks. My doorbell has just rung, so I'm going to have to dash off for two seconds. But dash I will, off and uh, get you, that you doorbell. Listen, Fabrizio's my... phone's ringing. I'm on my phone right because now. I have a breaking news for you. Danjuma has just signed this contract with Tottenham. So finally, this story is over. We can consider Danjuma as new Tottenham player. The deal is finally done. So it will be official, I think, in a few minutes, but it's now completed. Fabrizio, can we do this properly? Can we get a here we go from Fabrizio of Romano? Of course, a big here we go for, uh, for Danjuma to, to Tottenham. Big one because it's one more surprising story of this window. It's a very surprising one because it was done deal with, uh, with Everton. 100% done with Everton. He had the medical. He had all the media stuff with Everton. And then what happened is that Tottenham, in the night between Monday and Tuesday, they decided to enter the race to convince the player. Uh, also, the decision to fire Frank Lampard, of course, uh, had uh, a, big, a big impact on the player. And so this is how Tottenham decided to hijack the deal. And so we can say that Danjuma will be new Tottenham player. The contracts are signed. We were waiting for this step because after what happened with Everton, it was a really important one on this on this story. But medical completed, contract signed. And so Danjuma to Tottenham on loan. It's a straight loan deal. No buy option, no closes included. Six-month loan. And then they will decide in the summer how to proceed with Villarreal. Fantastic to hear that from Fabrizio right here. Breaking news on House of Champions. Welcome along, everyone. James Benj's doorbell just rang, and apparently Fabrizio Romano's phone just buzzed because we got breaking news. The deal for Dan Juma is done. Let's begin there. Let's switch things up. We were going to start with the Americans, but let's begin with that because it is breaking news. So, of course, we have uh, the deal you mentioned there, the loan deal. But how did this play out, Fabrizio? Because at first, we thought, okay, Everton, everything's going to be smooth transition. And then all of a sudden, when you see this hijacking taking place, there must be a story behind it. Yes, and there is a story because the deal, uh, as I mentioned before, with Everton was 99.9% .9 done. He had all the media staff. Uh, he did the medical on Saturday. He was with the team on Monday. So everything was done for, for the Juma's new Everton player. But they were still waiting to sign the contracts. And 99% of the cases, this is just a detail when you have the media staff, the medical and everything. So this is just like the formal final step and then the deal is official. In this case, Tottenham decided to enter the race. I'm not so surprised in this case about Tottenham because I know how the director Paratici works, something that he already did in the past with many other players. They tried to do the same, for example, with Gabriel Jesus last summer when the player already decided to join Arsenal, so it was impossible to, to proceed. But it's not the first time we see this kind of, of move uh, on, on Tottenham's side. And so they decided to enter the race because they wanted, we know, uh, Nicolò Zaniolo from uh, Roma, but Roma are not accepting less than 35, 40 million euros guaranteed fee. And so Tottenham were also exploring other options, uh, other wingers on the market. Danjuma on a loan, uh, I think, is a very good opportunity. He's a very good player. Uh, although he already knows the league. Uh, he already knows also the Champions League level with Villarreal. So he's a very good player, a very good opportunity. So during the night, they decided to contact the player to understand the contract situation that was not signed yet. So the player changed his mind. Uh, this is something surprising, I know, for Everton fans and also shocking for the board because they considered the player as new signing. But now Danjuma decided to sign with Tottenham. So he had the medical yet. Yesterday was completed today in the morning, and now we can say that Danjuma signed the contract as new Spurs player. It's an interesting one, isn't it? Because, you know, it didn't feel like a, a, a logical signing for Tottenham, maybe where they were looking to strengthen. We know they're looking at right wing back. We know they're looking maybe at central midfield. Was this maybe like, from what you're hearing, a case of a, a deal that was too good to turn down? And, and also, what is this going to mean for, for Son and for Conte? You know, you've got this left winger, this superstar left winger who's out of form and, and obviously a manager that continually demands new signings to be convinced of the ambition. I mean, like, I can't imagine that Dan Juma would change Conte's mind on things. No, I agree with you. This is not just Dan Juma, but I think Tottenham will do something else in the next hours, probably in days, because they're really busy on, on many deals. I think it was a big opportunity to give Conte 
one more player in that position, one more winger, a player who is ready to have an impact uh, at this level in Premier League. And also, as I mentioned before, in the Champions League, he can be helpful. So this is why they decided to go for this kind of opportunity. It's the typical January opportunity. This is a signing, a signing that you are never doing, I think, in, in July, in August. But in January, you have this kind of opportunities. And the Juma had some problems in the dressing room at Villarreal. This is why he was available on the market on a straight loan. It's a big, a big chance, a big opportunity. And this is why Tottenham decided to proceed. But it's not just Danjuma, because the next one, I think it will be Pedro Porro from Sporting. This right back was a very good player, one of the best right backs around, a really interesting deal. Uh, Sporting won 45 million euros, the full release close paid. Tottenham are offering around 38 plus add ons, but there is a meeting right now while we are speaking in Lisbon between the intermediaries to discuss. So Tottenham and Sporting are speaking. The player has an agreement with Tottenham. He's prepared to join Tottenham. And so I think after Danjuma, it will be Pedro Porro. And let's see if Tottenham will do something else in the final days of the window, but they will be really busy in the next hours for sure. Hey, Fabrizio, we've got a great question coming in here and pretty much a comment more than anything else from Ali A saying, uh, Fabrizio, we have seen a lot of hijacking in the last few transfer windows. Are you noticing it a little bit more different for players? It seems like players have a lot of power. They're managing to manipulate transfers, but we're also seeing there's no loyalty in this business. The best club wins. The quickest club wins. The best deal will win here. Yes, this is the point for sure. Uh, the one you mentioned about, uh, of course, the money and the best club and the best project. So this is absolutely normal. I think what is changing is also about the media. Uh, I think the media in the last two, three, four, five years have changed this game. Uh, it was easier to keep it secret a few years ago. And now on the media, you can find all the details, all the steps of a transfer. So when the player is having a medical, when the player is signing the contract. So the, for the clubs, for the agents, for the intermediaries, it's really easy to understand what's going on. And it's really difficult for many clubs to keep it secret. So this is why I think it's easier for many clubs to jump into deals and, and hijack a move even when it's almost completed like Danjuma to, to Everton. Well, there you have it. Breaking news right here on House of Champions. For Bito Romano, Danjuma move is complete to Tottenham Hotspur. He is now a Spurs player. James Benj also in the house with me. We're going to turn our attention to the Americans right now. Fabrizio, feel free to tweet. If you've got to get messages out there, feel no free problem, to do no your problem. business. We do not want to know. stop you. Yeah, please <laughs> do. Um, but let's talk about Weston McKinney because the rumors are starting to heat up about Weston. You tweeted yesterday that talks are ongoing between Leeds United and Juventus. What is the latest on Weston McKinney apparently leaving Juve? Yes, Juventus and Leeds are now speaking about the conditions of the deal. So Leeds want to understand how much Juventus will ask for a potential term, a transfer of, of Weston McKennie. Leeds already had conversations on player side. It was really positive, I'm told, because McKennie would be prepared to accept Leeds conditions. He would be happy to try a Premier League experience. So no problem on player side. Now it's, it's on Leeds and Juventus. So there are conversations ongoing. They will speak also today. Leeds have two options. One is Weston McKennie and the other one is Azedin Wani, Wani, the midfielder of Morocco, who had a fantastic wood carp. So it could be an opportunity yeah. for Leeds. But we know it's not easy to sign him because probably the price tag is more than 30 million euros. So not an easy one. But Leeds also had conversations with the agents of Unahi. So these are the two options. They will sign a new midfielder. McKennie is the priority now. So we can say that Leeds are really pushing. Let's see how the conversation with Juventus will go, how much Juventus will ask, because McKenney, as we mentioned in our last episode, uh, is always a player who is available on the market, but at the same time he's playing. He's an important player for Allegri. So it's about the financial deal in this case, and let's see how the conversation will continue also today. I love McKenney. He's perfect Premier League player, I have to say. And I think in Leeds, maybe that extra extra bit of intensity, he'd be great. Um, Fab, I wanted to ask you about Christian Pulisic. Talking to people I know around AC Milan yesterday, there was a sense that at some stage, you know, if, if this situation continues, maybe not till the summer, you know, Milan will take a serious look at Pulisic and uh, and put that put a bid in, test Chelsea's resolve. He'll only have, I think, a year left on his contract at the end of the season. I mean, there's so many teams want him other than Chelsea, though, aren't there? What are you expecting? Do we do you think, given he's injured, we'll see any movement this month? Maybe someone will try and get ahead of the pack, or uh, will do you think Milan can kind of hold out? Because uh, from what I've heard as well, they're looking at Zaniolo. So might this be one that we see more mu movement on in the summer? Yes, from what they heard, the priority for Milan is Zaniolo in this moment uh, because Maldini is a big fan of Zaniolo, so they are speaking to Roma for, for the Zaniolo deal. But at the moment, they are offering around 22 million euros and Roma won 35, 40. So there is still a big gap between the two clubs. So let's see how this Zaniolo conversation will, will continue. But Zaniolo would love to, to join Milan. So for sure, this is a possibility. About Pulisic, the problem is the injury because uh, I, I think it was our, one of our first episodes here in, in the new year, 2023. And we said, keep an eye on Chelsea because if they 
sign a new winger, the plan is to sell Pulisic. That was the plan, from what I'm told. So to bring in a new winger, Modric, and then to let one player leave, and the player was Pulisic. Then the injury is creating a problem, because, of course, with that kind of injury, almost two months out, it's really difficult to move a player. So this is why my expectation is for him to stay until the summer and probably move in the summer to another club, and let's see if another league, because it's true that there is interest in Italy, but also in other countries. As you mentioned, there are many clubs interested in Pulisic. Also in, in Germany, Newcastle wanted him last summer. May United also asked about the situation before proceeding with the transfer of Anthony. So there's always been a lot of interest, but I think the transfer is not likely in the, in the summer more than, more than January. You're watching House of Champions. It's the great Fabrizio Romano and the legendary James Ben joining us today on the show. We've already had one. Here we go with Dan Juma's transfer to Tottenham Hotspur. Let's uh, stick with some Chelsea news right here. We're hearing about Ziyech, apparently his move out of the club. We're hearing about a new deal for Silva. We have some comments coming in. 444 is jumping in about Chelsea and potentially Enzo. And we have Vic also jumping in. That's his club right there. A lot of big followers of House of Champions. They want to know the latest about what's happening at the bridge. Fabrizio, you got anything for us? So, Thiago Silva contract is a serious possibility. They are speaking. Thiago is super happy with Chelsea. Chelsea are more than happy with Thiago. So, I think there is a very good chance for them to continue together. The final step is about Thiago speaking to his family because we know about his age and so it's normal for him to decide together with his family what they want to do, uh, whether they want to continue in, uh, in Europe or maybe go back to Brazil. But at the moment, the feeling of Chelsea is that they have a very good chance to continue with Thiago Silva for one more season. Um, speaking about other players, Enzo Fernandez, at the moment, I'm told there are no direct conversations with Benfica. The last contact was a secret one. Chelsea tried to do almost the same they did with Mudrik one week ago, speaking to Benfica and trying to understand if there was a chance to open again the negotiations. But from Benfica, and in particular from the president, Manuel Ricosta, the message to Chelsea and to the intermediaries of the deal was 120 million euros or nothing. No way to negotiate, no way for different payment terms. You have to pay the full release clause or nothing. So let's see if Chelsea will decide to proceed. But at the moment, I'm not aware of any advanced negotiation. I think it's really difficult to sign Enzo, Enzo Fernandez now. The real priority for Chelsea now is Malo Gusto, this right back playing for Lyon. Very good player, very interesting talent. Many clubs have been following him for, for months, but now for Chelsea it's a very big opportunity because they had an opening bid rejected for 20 million euros, but I'm told that they will return. They will try again with a new proposal. They agreed personal terms with the player, so there is a good chance for Malo Gusto to join, uh, to join Chelsea. Let's see if they will be able to reach an agreement with Lyon, but this is their priority. Fantastic. I love to hear it, Fabrizio. You're all across the board right now. You're on the ball. I love it. Can I ask you a question once again about the Bundesliga and Borussia Dortmund? Because I continue to hear about Jude Bellingham and the potential rumors of him staying at the football club and signing a new extension to uh, be a, a Borussia Dortmund player for the foreseeable future. What are you hearing about Jude Bellingham? Everybody wants this kid. We know he's a tremendous talent, but I love watching him play for the black and yellow. Yes, I hope Borussia Dortmund fans will not hate me, but uh, we tried our best with Mukoko telling them, remember that Mukoko has a chance to stay in the contract, and he extended the contract. For Jude Bellingham, I can't say the same. I think Jude Bellingham will move in the summer. I think Jude Bellingham will have uh, very big clubs uh, around him. They already has very big clubs around him, because I'm told Jurgen Klopp is calling every single day to move directly on this deal for, for Jude Bellingham in the summer. Real Madrid are interested. Manchester City are really interested too. We know how unpredictable are Chelsea on the market. So let's see how long will take the situation and if Chelsea will try to for Jude Bellingham. But I think Liverpool are now really pushing and the race is with too many top clubs for Jude Bellingham to stay at Dortmund for one more season. So I think also them know that it's going to be really complicated to keep the player for one more season. What else about the Bundesliga in particular? If you don't mind me asking about Bayern Munich, I watched their game yesterday and uh, they had two promoting playing up front. And uh, of course, I'm going to turn this to a bit of a Harry Kane discussion because I know the rumours are out there about him signing a new contract. But to me, Fabrizio, Harry Kane would be the perfect fit for a club like Bayern Munich. The question would be, why would he want to go there? And with Bayern Munich winning trophies, especially domestically, why would he not want to go there? So what about the latest on potential search for a striker for Bayern Munich? Because you cannot tell me that Bayern Munich are going to stick with Chupo Moting only going forward. No, no, no. Bayer will go for a striker in the summer. That was the strategy. They decided to wait a bit instead of wasting money on a player they were not trusting maybe at the end of August after the Lewandowski story last summer. They decided to wait a bit and to move for a striker in summer 2023. So I think in the next months, the situation will be clear. Uh, as we already mentioned, it, there will be a big domino of striker. I think there will be many clubs on the market for a new striker. Let's see what happens with the Spanish clubs. Uh, for example, with Atletico Madrid, if Real Madrid will look also for a backup for Karim Benzema, but there will be Italian clubs with Milan for sure on the market for a striker, probably Inter, and of course English clubs, because Chelsea will be there. I think Newcastle will be there again. Uh, there will be Manchester United for sure. So 
a big domain of strikers and Bayern will be there. The point on Harry Kane is that at the moment, uh, on player side, is still nothing advanced with Bayern, with Man United or any other club. The player is speaking to Tottenham. They had meetings to discuss the new contract. There will be new conversations in the next months. So Tottenham will try their best to keep Harry Kane. I'm sure they will offer him a new deal uh, also in the next few months. And uh, this is the priority also for the player, to speak to Tottenham. I think Antonio Conte's future is going to be really important and Tottenham project in general. But the manager situation is going to be really important for Harry Kane to decide. Bayern interest is confirmed. We know it's not a secret. Bayern love Harry Kane. Also Oliver Kahn, Arsene Salihamidzic, when they were speaking in public, they always said how much they love Harry Kane. Kane, but to sign a player is not going to be easy at all. Yeah, very, very difficult. I'm glad you turned it back to the Premier League because we do have a ton of questions coming in about Arsenal Football Club. So I want to hear what you've got to say about the latest on Arsenal and also want to hear from James as well. Um, this one comes in from Aaron Alexander. He says, any news on Arsenal progressions on Caicedo, on Nana, Fresneda? Also, how likely are Arsenal in the race to sign Declan Rice in summer? As report said, Arsenal are in current pole position. Here we go. Yes, about around this name, on Caicedo, they just had some conversations with his new agents. He has now new agents, and so it's normal for clubs to have information. So they had some conversation, but Chelsea are really interested. They had the director, Paul Will Stanley, who was at Brighton, and of course, Graham Potter, who knows the player very well. So this is why Chelsea are really interested in Caicedo. But at the moment, the situation is still not easy at all, because Brighton want to keep the player at least until the summer. So it's not going to be an easy one for, for Caicedo. And I want to mention Fresneda, because this guy is, is really interesting. Uh, he's a very big talent, born in 2004. But at the moment, what I'm told is that Borussia Dortmund are offering to Real Valladolid to keep the player for six months. So they sign the player now for 15 million euros and let the player stay on loan till the end of the season there. So this could be a key point for the deal, but the player has not decided yet. Arsenal are now uh, giving the green light for uh, Cedric Soares to join Fulham on loan till the end of the season. And this could be another important point for the negotiation. So I think in the next two, three days, the situation of Fresneda will be clear because his agent is in England. He's speaking to Arsenal. He's speaking also to Borussia Dortmund. Let's see. It's a big fight for uh, for Fresneda. For Declan Rice, I think for Arsenal is one of the priorities for the summer, but James knows more than me. <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> I'm sure. Really don't. I do know a little. Um, I do know that, that um, Declan Rice, and I reported this on cbssports.com, that he, he's been speaking, I think they're his priority, as well as him being their Arsenal's priority. i um, been speaking in absolutely glowing terms about them behind closed doors, and I think he's really fascinated by this move. One other thing on Fresneda that I would add, um, I don't, I don't know yet whether Arsenal would be happy to, to, to loan him back to Valladolid. But one thing to bear in mind is there's this growing expectation at Arsenal right now that Kieran Tierney could move in the summer. I don't think Arsenal would push him out the exit door, but now he's not a guaranteed starter. I think if the right offer came in, all parties are kind of thinking this is something that might happen, not guaranteed. In that case, what you could see is Fresneda coming in to play alongside Ben White as the uh, as the two right backs, and then Tomiyasu actually basically becomes the backup left back. It's a role he's played quite a bit for Arteta. So, it, I wouldn't shock me if Arsenal were were willing to do the same thing as Dortmund and, and loan Fresneda back. Tierney wins his Premier League medal, maybe, and moves on. <laughs> Well, it completely makes sense uh, when you think about it. And obviously, it's trying to move the pieces around perfectly so that Arsenal do go ahead and win that Premier League title, James. That's what the battle is right now, making sure you've got the tools that you need necessary for that long-run race because it's going to be a battle between now and the end of the season. Uh, real quickly, uh, Fabrizio, if you don't mind me turning my attention to Newcastle United and Everton, there's a great question coming in from Philip Sranko. He's asking, have Everton accepted a bid for Gordon from Newcastle United? I love the way Newcastle do business. Everton, it's a bit of a mess right now, What's happened and, and it's, it's difficult for them to keep a hold of their best players yes it's difficult and it's also slow the negotiation is slow because i think it's normal they lost a player like danjuma they're negotiating for many players i think they open talks for like seven eight players at the same moment at the same time they fired the manager so all these players and agents who had conversations for everton with the lampard project now they don't know who's going to be the coach and so the conversations are slow we know what kind of mess is also with the owners at the moment the situation is really difficult at everton so this is why the conversations between everton and newcastle are really slow also for gordon there is a negotiation ongoing newcastle made a bid is around i'm told 35 million pounds plus add-ons. So they are discussing also about the add-on structure and this kind of details. At the moment, it's not a done deal yet. We have to wait and we have to see if Everton will accept. But it's also important to understand what kind of project Everton want to do, who's going to be the new manager, what they want to do with new signings, because it's a really complicated situation this week. So let's wait for some, some days for it to be clear. But for sure, Newcastle won't Gordon. They have no problem in reaching an agreement with the players. So it's on Everton now. 
Last minute, we've got with Fabrizio Romano. You're watching House of Champions. James Bench also in the house. This one, we're going to go about Real Madrid. The transfer plan. Subin Tutu's asking, uh, Fran Garcia, Asensio future, and anything else you have to do with Real Madrid? Uh, relatively quiet up to now. Yeah, it's really quiet, but in Real Madrid style, they always do like this, especially in, in January, they plan for the future. And Fran Garcia as a player, of course, they know very well. Uh, he was there and they are always monitoring this guy. So for sure, Fran Garcia is an option for the summer, not for January at the moment. But for the summer is a possibility they are considering. They will take some time. Eh? Real Madrid will not decide now for the summer. We mentioned Jude Bellingham is a top target for Real Madrid. But as we said, Liverpool, Man City will be there. So let's see what happens with Bellingham in the next in the next months. And for Asensio, there is a conversation with his agent to extend the contract because Asensio is out of contract in the summer. So it could be a big free agent. But Real Madrid are still speaking to Asensio to extend the contract. Let's see how the conversation will go. But let me remind that it's true. Real Madrid have been quiet, but they also spent 72 million euros of on, on Hendrik, this boy born uh, in 2006, who is a top talent, one of the best in the world, and they invested very big money on him. So it's true that he's coming in 2024, but I think top signing. I'd like to thank Fabrizio Romano for reminding us all that we're very, very old now when you talk about players <laughs> born in 2006. It's incredible. Hey, listen, we had one. Here we go today. It was my first on House of Champions. Can't thank you enough for uh, that, Fabrizio. We appreciate all the hard work you're doing thank right you. now. We're going to let you go. You have been absolutely fantastic. Make sure everybody out there is following the legendary Fabrizio Romano across all of our social media platforms. Not only is he a great soccer brain, he is also thank one you. who is breaking news in the transfer market. So thank you so much to Fabrizio. Uh, stick Thanks around so everybody much. there's more to come from us after the break the boys will be back we'll invite in of course Michael LaHood keep those questions coming in we're going to discuss the mess that's going on at Everton Football Club and some Premier League news next so how's the champions we'll be right back the UEFA Champions League knockout phase Europe's yearly do or die battle royale where winning is all that matters the knockout rounds begin February 14th and 15th stream every match live exclusively on Paramount Plus Anytime I hear that Champions League sound, it makes me excited. I know the Champions League is not too far away, but guess what's going on right now? The Serie A. So don't miss out on any of the Serie A action. Follow some of the biggest stars in the sport, like Olivier Giroud, Rafael Leal, Otaru Martinez, as they try to lead their teams to Scudetto. How will the table change going forward? Which club will have the best chance of winning it all? Which clubs have the most to lose? Find out all the answers and stream every match from Italy's top soccer league live only on Paramount Plus, try one month free with the promo code Seria A. Let's welcome in with a golf clap, James Bench, Michael <laughs> LaHood to the show. He's finally figured out the technical difficulties <sighs> and he's back in the show. How are you, buddy? Ah, I'm doing good. I'm doing great. And I wish I could say I'm doing grand. Still butthurt over the United loss, but that's not why we're here. We can do that <laughs> Thursday. James has got a big smile on his face. We'll let you guys discuss <laughs> that one in just a minute here. Uh, let's get back into the show. Obviously, there's a lot happening at Everton Football Club. A lot of discussion right there about transfers going in and out of the football club. Um, it's a mess right now. James Benjamin, I'm coming to you first because in the last, what, weeks, we've had Lampard being sacked, Dan Jumo going elsewhere. The fans are clearly unhappy with the ownership. Alan Stubbs, I heard, is asking for the board to be sacked or replaced. Um, mm. And the owner, <laughs> Moshiri, <laughs> is under severe criticism. So what a mess is uh, this is really for the ownership group right now. I guess the first and foremost question I'd have for you, rather than talk about the ownership first, I want to ask you about your opinion. Was it the right decision to fire Frank Lampard? Yes, because it was the wrong decision to hire Frank Lampard. I mean, he is, you know, there is clearly like a niche he has. I think he did okay at Derby. He did okay at Chelsea when he was bringing through young players. And there was a little moment, and I remember this quite well because I got sent to Watford nil, Everton nil, which was a crucial, a dreadful game, <laughs> but a crucial game in Everton surviving last season. And there was a moment where like, he harnessed something by making them a hard team to watch, but a hard team to beat. Um, and there was no progress on from that. Um, you know, I think we should package everything together. It was the right decision to sack Frank Lampard. But Everton as a club have been making so few right decisions. You know, it, it, it's easy to see why the anger was aimed predominantly at the board because they keep hiring the wrong managers. They keep kind of mm. making these decisions that are madly out of place. I thought Miguel Delaney wrote wrote, wrote wonderfully in The Independent um, mm. talking about how Everton keep acting like a big club. Um, but big clubs are smart. Big clubs learn. Big clubs don't throw money away and they're, they're shrewd in their recruitment. I mean, Everton have spent a huge amount of money to have a squad. And there's a lot of debate about this. But actually, when I look at that squad, I think that's a squad that 
isn't is sort of 18th, 19th in the league. Yeah. That doesn't mean that Frank Lampard hasn't done a bad job. He has. Like they don't. They, managers are supposed to make players better than you know you might say they are on paper. Yeah, but he's kind of not been given the tools to be successful mm-hmm. at all. Uh, I think that's well said, James. When you look at the track record, even after David Moyes, Everton Football Club was a difficult place to go and play. David Moyes proved that with the success they had in the Premier League. But after, even after David Moyes, after Roberto Martinez, you have nine managers from 2016 to present day. That is not stability. That is not the Everton Football Club way. They become so easy to play against. And when you look at the player recruitment, you're telling me you're going to survive the Premier League with Connor Cody as one of your headliners, Neil Mopway, who got just gifted away as one of your headliners. It's not good enough. And if it's not good enough from the top, if there's disarray at the top, I've been there as a player. It trickles down into the locker room, onto the field, and everyone feels it. There's just not enough belief. The fans don't even believe, and rightfully so, Frank Lampard got sacked. I mean, this is a club that Carlo Ancelotti could not get away, wait to get away from. And he goes and wins the Champions League with Real Madrid. Can I just dive yeah. in there? I wanted to maybe talk through, because uh, because I think a lot of the times when we when fans get upset at owners, we always kind of filter it through this prism of, oh, there's not, you know, it must be about how much money's being spent and all that. And and actually, this is not what Everton fans are angry about. Um, and rightly so. They're, they're not angry about a lack of of ambition or a lack of expenditure. Bear in mind, they're building a 500 million pound stadium on Bramley Dock as well. You know, it's it's about a lack of competence. I mean, I'm going to read you here the, the, the record signings that, that Everton have made. And you tell me, you stop me when you think you, you hear a, an unqualified success. I think there are maybe two or three in the top 10. Uh, at 10 is, is Moisey Kane. Nine, Jordan Pickford. Good, I would say. Pretty good. Um, He's a better eight, DJ. Michael then. Keane. Seven, Yannick Balassi. Six, Yeri Mina. Five, 30 million, actually it's more than 30 million euros. Alex Wobi, uh, Amadou Anana, Romelu Lukaku, Richarlison, and then Gilfie Sigurdsson. And like the only ones that are there other than Pickford that have been any good are the ones that they've sold on pretty quickly. Yeah, really interesting. Obviously, when you think of the names that have come through Everton Football Club, and, and not just the names who have come through, it's also the players that they've produced at Everton because they have a fantastic academy mm-hmm. and they really do a great job if you consider the players that have come in and actually been sold from the football club over the years. It's a very good business when you're bringing these young, talented scousers through and putting them through the Everton first team and then selling them on. But at the end of the day, we'd have to say, Michael, that this is a very badly run business. Now, obviously, uh, Jamie Carragher, obviously you can watch him on Paramount Plus uh, with the Champions League when it does return on February 14th, um, very great and critical breakdown and said that this is the worst run football club in the Premier League. I mean, this was a thorough breakdown and he's an Everton fan and, and obviously he's grown up watching Everton. Um, mm. But he basically pointed out that the ownership group will never stop receiving this criticism because Scousers are different. They, they understand that you fired the manager, but it's not going to stop the criticism or the banners being out in the stadium in the direction of the ownership group. So my question to you would be, Exactly what has gone wrong with this business? Because as far as I'm concerned, I'm not an Everton fan. I'm on the outside looking in. The owners pumped in a lot of money to this football club. They're clearly moving in the right direction with their own stadium, which makes sense to me. But on the pitch, everything's gone wrong. And it doesn't seem to me like the players are bought into the project overall. Well, you, you look at the philosophies since the ownership group have come in. They've gone money heavy, going for big names. I think it started wrong with the likes of Ronald Koeman, who was never there for Everton Football Club in the inception. If you start with a manager like that, proved it at Barcelona, topsy-turvy, now you're playing scramble. Now you come in and try and bring in a couple fillers, and then you're, you're looking for the next big name to resurrect Everton Football Club. You go for Carlo Ancelotti, who was frustrated. He brought in big names, the James Rodriguez's, players from Syria, and it didn't pan out for him because he was looking for his exit strategy. And then that labels Everton Football Club as a club that no one wants to go to who has a CV or a resume. That is not the way for Everton Football Club. They are gritty. They they have British managers of the of old, and they use local players. If you look at the team, a lot of the local players are now being used because, well, we don't have anyone else. No one else is panning out. The one player that I do like, for Everton that I think has a bright future and I would be looking to get the hell out of Dodge is Amadou Onana, the Belgian defensive midfielder. I think he has a bright future. I could see a Premier League club coming for him in any transfer window coming up. That is the one golden goose for them to rely on. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree. But it's what's quite interesting is he's kind of one angle of recruitment that they've taken. I really like Mikalenko. I like Nathan Patterson mm-hmm. as well, the, the fullbacks. And, you know, this sort of seems like the sort of transfers that would be made by your director of football. They're young, they've got resale value and can grow together as a team. Sort of players that maybe you can surround like a Calvert-Lewin with. Um, and then you have Mashiri will dive in every once in a while and go, hey, everyone, I've got you. James Rodriguez, uh, you know, gets excited, likes the feeling of of owning a, a club. And, you know, obviously, you know, in close tandem, he, he was certainly when he was at Arsenal in close tandem with uh, Alicia Usmanov. And I think there was kind of a, there was a dream from those two of owning Arsenal. And it feels a little bit like they're like, well, we've not got a traditional big six club, but we'll go to Everton and we'll act like, and historically they are one of the big six. You know, we will act like a mega club but you aren't, you don't have the pulling power. You know, you don't have the, quite the history of Liverpool, of Man United. You you can't offer the wages of a Man City. Um, And so you end up with this sort of really weirdly melded together squad where then every manager comes in and they go, yes, I understand that you want to build for the future, but right now I need James Tarkovsky. I need Michael Keane or Connor Cody just so that I can keep it tight for this season. And I'm, Mm -hmm. I am genuinely of the view that the best case scenario for Everton right now is that this isn't the David Moyes year at Sunderland. It's the Allardyce year or it's the Dick Advocat year. It's another year where they just about scrabble to safety. And that's kind of where they're at. But Hmm. it's coming. Like the relegation, I think, is it feels almost inevitable for Everton because what are they going to be able to do next summer when they still have all these players on huge wages that they can't get out from under? Because why on earth would you want to buy Decore, Gay, Iwobi, you know, all those sort of players, Tarkovsky, you're stuck with them. So you can't really recruit as much as you'd like. So yeah. you need to hope that the manager hits. I think it's just, it's a matter of whether it's this season or next, unless Mashiri settles and someone can really come and, and sweep the board. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see if he does sell, obviously, with the rumours of the club being put up for sale right now. Um, great point, both of you there. And obviously fantastic, taking it back to the, the, the performance on the pitch more anything else really in the business side of things we can all criticize the ownership we can criticize obviously the fans are very outspoken at Everton and they have a right to be outspoken um, but if we turn it back to the professional side it seems to me like Everton have dodged it over years I mean we're talking 10 12 15 years where Everton have been dodging it and have been dodging it and have been just kind of kicking the can a little bit further down the road now Vic's jumping in the comments right now clearly saying that Frankie Lampard should never have taken that job he says Everton is an absolute failure of a club thanks to their owner the board is far from reality and hence the reason why many former ex-players of Everton are coming out and criticizing the board asking for them to be replaced Um, and it is easy to blame Frank Lampard because the performances have not been good now my personal take on it is that Everton is a club that has and always will have a desire for players who play with passion, who play with heart, who play with fight. You can't have your James Rodriguez is rolling up and picking up a paycheck and you know playing one game out of 10. It doesn't work for Everton Football Club. They, they need people to fight for that club every single day. And that's why you go back to it, Michael, to your youngsters getting the opportunity. They live and breathe the football club. They want to play for Everton Football Club. It's been their dream their ambition to play for these supporters week in and week out. So now my question to you, Michael, come to you first. Mm. Who would be the next man to take over from Frank Lampard that could get the best out of these players to potentially save Everton? I'm in a group chat with a lot of my former Tramia Rovers uh, teammates, and there's 25 of us in there. And as you can imagine, there's probably three Everton fans from that 25 (laughs) that are in there. And they're the loudest, most outspoken players you could ever have imagined talking about Everton Football Club and how great it is. But they're now scared, Michael. So who's the man to lead Everton forward? And I want to ask that question to the followers out there. Yeah. Drop us in a comment who you think would be the right person to take over from Frank Lampard. Uh, I'm smiling because sometimes it's the person that's already been there right in front of you that you don't appreciate enough. Duncan Ferguson, Everton football legend. He's already had enough experiences, a couple experiences of getting a few results in emergency situations for the club. Players will respect him. He will inject the the, the, what the culture means, what grit means. I mean, he epitomized that as a Premier League striker and a Premier League legend of his own. 
I think that's the guy that they go for. And, and, and stop trying to go for these super sexy names. Get back to basics. Get back to a guy who will put players on the field that follow in his example. I think he's the guy. I actually, I really like that idea. It wasn't where I, I was leaning towards, but it, it's up there. I would still stick with the the player, the manager I'm going to name, um, which 444 has just said as well. It's Sam Allardyce. You know, this is the real problem I think that Everton have is that right now they need to stay up. They need a manager who can come in and Allardyce isn't perfect at this, but he can grab the reins, sort out the defense, 442. You know, we will get to 40 points come hell or high water. And then you go again from there. I think the advantage with Allardyce is he would, as much as he doesn't like the label, I think he probably now is of the age and, you know, of the experience that he knows that this would only be for this season. I think the Everton fans came to, at best, begrudgingly respect him rather than outright despise him during his sort of tenure. Was it after Kuma? I can't remember which manager he was after. As as Mike explained, there's been so many. Yeah. Um, but you just need someone to stay up and then... M- maybe you get some lucky breaks in the summer um, and hope, you know, maybe you can invest the Anthony Gordon money wisely. And by the way, like they're going to get 20 million less for him, a mid tier premier league midfielder than they would have got if they'd just been smart enough to sell in the summer, because he's not that good. And you don't need to be doing these things. They wanted to hold on to him because it was a statement of intent that we don't lose our best young players. Well, he's not that good a young player. You should have sold him. <laughs> we got a comment coming in from BX Gunner 81 saying, How about Daish? Matt Osman saying, Stevie G, you saw it come across your screen there just a moment ago. And then we also have backing you up, Michael LaHood, a couple of shouts for Big Dunk. Rafa jumps in with that one. And um, and then Vic jumps in and says, Son, Sean Daish and Duncan as an assistant is the way to go. Big Sam will not take the job, which is an interesting question right there. Um, just a real quick story on Duncan Ferguson. James, you probably know this one. Michael, you probably don't. And I'm sure a lot of of our followers out there don't know this story about Duncan Ferguson. So at one point when he was playing for Everton Football Club, he um, he had his newborn baby sleeping in his living room, right? For, for, for whatever reason, he was sleeping away from the, the master bedroom, sleeping in his living room on the sofa, right? And two people made the biggest mistake in their lives by trying to break <laughs> into Duncan Ferguson's house <laughs> while he was sleeping on the sofa, right? And this is not what a lie. You can go Google it, go research the story. It's a fantastic story. And um, whilst holding the baby in one hand, Duncan Ferguson proceeded to beat the shit out of these two guys <laughs> who rolled into his uh, his house trying to obviously steal some stuff. It was an amazing story. But that's Duncan Ferguson for you. And we all remember in the recent years with Big Dunk taking the job for a minute there, most importantly, trying to share this passion of, of what Everton Football Club is. Nobody can understand what he's saying. He's a Scottish man with so much passion. But we all struggle to understand what the Scousers are saying. But that's the passion that Everton Football Club need. My father, uh, Brian, he obviously watches every show because he, he watches everything I do, which is great. Great. Love to you, Dad. Um, his former boss and also very good friend, Brian, is a massive Everton fan. And he makes a two and a half hour journey. James, you'll appreciate this one. Two and a half hour journey <laughs> to go watch Everton Football Club play. He's decided this week that he's not going to go. It's, is it mm. Arsenal this week? Is uh, it Arsenal this week? The Arsenal's the next game, yeah, because they've got this Arsenal's week. Arsenal's next game. Yeah. He's not going to that game. He's choosing not to go watch Everton against Arsenal because he can't take it anymore. It's an absolute mess that's happened with the club. But that's what we're going to have. We're going to yes. have this where fans just stop buying into the project. So what next for Everton? What do you think will happen? What would be a success, Michael? Um, start playing for the championship because it ain't happening. <laughs> and we, we didn't even get into the weeds about... So you say relegation? I say relegation. I don't see Ooh. it happening. They have not replaced... Their leading goal scorer from last year. They sold him to Tottenham Hotspur. Real Charleston. Calvert Lewin, the injury woes when he's when he's on, okay, gets close to goal. If you do not score goals in the English Premier League, you will not stay up. And they have this thing that happens in their brains after the halftime whistle blows. They'll be competitive. If they don't give up an early goal, they'll be competitive. But in the 50th minute, they start leaking goals. It, it's an amazing stat that they came across. They have conceded so many goals after the 50th minute onward that there's something wrong there and psychological. And I think it's it's hit the point of no return for this club. Yeah, I'm with Mike. I don't see it. I don't really care who they hire and who they sign because I don't think, I just can't see a world where any of them are good enough to turn this 
this team around. And I'll go a little further. I don't think they will go full Sunderland collapsing down into League One. But if they get relegated, I certainly don't think they'll come back up straight away. I hope I'm proven wrong because we have to say this would be really dark times for Everton. They're not in a good financial state. But um, I think they're gone. And I, I fear we may not see them straight back in the Premier League soon after. Wow. Rafa jumping in and saying, Mike, you're right, they're going down here. Uh, Gunnar saying Richarlison single-handedly kept them up mm-hmm. last year and then all of a sudden was forced to sell him. And that's that's why I feel a bit sorry for Frank Lampard in particular, selling your best players. Vic, they will survive. It would be hard, but they'll survive. Stay strong, Evertonian mm-hmm. fans out there. And, and unfortunately, when you kick the can down the road, eventually it's going gonna, it's gonna to crack, right? It's going to break. And um, I feel like that's the way Everton are going. But we must not forget, they're only one or two wins away from getting out because it is incredibly tight at the bottom of the table just want to read you their next schedule uh coming up of games here james they have arsenal coming up which you would imagine obviously arsenal in the form that they're in they've got absolutely no chance then they've got an easy one at anfield against liverpool good luck with that one um (laughs) only what five days later they're at home to leeds united in what will be an absolute relegation battle it'll be interesting to see if jesse marsh is still in charge there and then at home to aston villa so those two games between leeds united and aston villa by the time we get there those are the ones where I would say, if you don't take maximum points from those two games, Leeds and Aston Villa at home, then you're down. James, am I wrong? No, I agree. I was just, I went way ahead. Yeah. <laughs> same. The final I day did the same. <laughs> of the season Oof. is Bournemouth at home. Ooh. And I wouldn't shock me if that is a game they have to win. Uh, and it is, you know, loser goes down. Because I think Bournemouth are quite rubbish. But that's, I, you know, when you do look at the table, there are quite a lot of teams that are just, playing a little bit better than Everton. You know, I think Wolves will get out. West Ham will yeah. get out eventually. Um, Southampton even are improving. So, uh, yeah. and Forest as well. So it just looks really tough for them if they don't put together a run now. Yeah. yeah. You know, Ian, I'm going to go to head of the schedule as well. I think the games that really get, are going to define them, I agree with you, Benj, on the last day against Bournemouth, the Wolves game before that and the Forest game If you're going to survive, you have to compete and get points off the teams that are within striking distance. The the Manchester Cities, they play Fulham, United, Brentford, City, Chelsea. Good God, Spurs. Hey, ciao. If there's a game game that you could look to potentially inspire your supporters and potentially get some confidence in the ranks, I'm not looking that far ahead. I'm looking at that Liverpool game because there's a vulnerability right now with Liverpool that Everton might be able to take because they're not playing well, Liverpool, James. At Anfield, though? I mean, if it was at Goodison Park, I'd be all with you. I mean, still, I mean, you know, I do agree. You've got a point there. And if if they get a point there, that does change. Remember the momentum it gave them last season when they were yeah. awful, but they mm-hmm. got the point. Like, or they were just yeah. incredibly defensive um, and dreadful in, in attack, but they got, got a point, was it? Or oh, they got a win? I can't quite remember. Like, <laughs> like you say, Ian, it can, ch- you know, that derby can change everything. And I have to say, you know, as much as we will all look at that Arsenal game and write it off, new manager banks, you never know. But, um, no, you do know. I just you're both thank you, Ben. Thank you. Thank think you. They're done. I appreciate <laughs> they're going it. Listen, down. Thanks for your honesty on Everton as well, because it's not easy to discuss it. Obviously, yeah. we're all kind of fond of Everton because of what they've done over history and, and who they are as a club. Mm. We all know an Everton fan who's struggling right now. So sending our love mm. to all of you Evertonians out there. Um, real quickly before we go, this is our final thoughts. I want everybody in the comments to jump in and let me know what they think about this one here. Uh, James, I'm coming to you first because I know this is gonna annoy the hell out of you. Gareth Bale. Recently <laughs> retired. Um, he is set to play in a PGA Tour event, the Pebble Beach Pro Am. Um, is this probably the perfect uh, place for Gareth Bale to continue his professional career? Because I hear he's good. Yeah, it's golf, golf, golf <laughs> in that order. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, fair enough. He's got a, he's got a lot a lot of years ahead of him, and it's um it's a shame to see. I mean, all those dodgy knee injuries he's had and, and the like is <laughs> golf the best sport for, for that I, I wait to see with bated breath I'd be surprised if he makes it today four if you play golf like Nigel Rio Coker then probably it's not good for you <laughs> with your knees and all that but apparently he's pretty good so I don't yeah. think there's much pressure on his knees what do you think about this Mike I mean I, I think, think it's pretty cool right yeah I think it's great this guy's doing what he loves Hey, look, why continue playing football if you've fallen out of love with it and you found your passion somewhere else? Look at that swing. You kidding me? 
He looked better doing that than he did in his last couple minutes with L. No, he actually had a brilliant last couple minutes with LAFC in the MLS. He won them yep. the damn championship. So look, you've done it. You won everything. You played in the World Cup to end your career. Go play golf, man. Enjoy. I hope. I, I hope he wins the whole. He won't win it, but I hope he does well. Enjoy. Do what you love. I'm going to put some pressure on CBS Sports and our producer, Des Norris, here because I wouldn't mind if we could get a game of golf with um, Gareth mm. Bale. I wouldn't mind if yeah. we could set that up. Maybe we could uh, do something. I think I could give him a run for his money. Just saying, just throwing <laughs> it out there. I play a bit of golf myself, James. You know what I mean? It took me, so I played my first round in about 15 years, or well, half a round. <laughs> um, I was telling you guys earlier, wasn't I, on the Ernie Els yeah. course in, in Langkawi, Malaysia. Nine holes took about three and a half hours. So, uh, <laughs> oh, Jesus. I hope Gareth has got enough time. <laughs> were, were, you, were you swinging in the, in the ocean? Look, there's a lot of water traps, <laughs> yeah. Mike. That's what I'm saying. And, and I only bought three balls. So uh, there's a lot of oh, deep dives to get my balls back. When he says water traps, he means halfway houses. There was a there was a halfway house in between every single hole. James Benjamin. Was. Was twice. Awesome stuff today. Absolutely fantastic. It was great to have that. Here we go from, um, obviously, Fabrizio Romano at the beginning of the show. And James uh, obviously had the doorbell ring. Who was that, James? Is that someone delivering your dinner? It's been me buying more shit that I don't need. <laughs> it's, it's Big Sam telling, you, telling him to keep your name out of his mouth, saying, don't bring me back to Everton. A comical start to the show. We got the here we go, and we ended off in style. Boys, I appreciate you greatly. Have a great uh, day. Obviously, we'll be back at it with a good preview uh, for the weekend coming up. We're really excited about that. Some great games to look forward to as well. But thanks, everybody out there for listening to House of Champions. Please take a minute to leave us a rating and a review. And on your favorite podcast platform, we're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and anywhere else you listen to your podcasts. Also available as videos, so subscribe to us on YouTube. Please leave a comment and a review if you possibly can. We appreciate it. It helps the algorithm. We're growing the show tremendously well because of you. We can't thank you all enough. We'll see you again next time. Thanks, James. Thanks, Mike. See you guys.